Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Please get cozy as we jump right into these Bigfoot and paranormal encounters. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe and ding that notification bell. I post new videos every single day and you'll be notified when they go live. Okay, let's get into it. During the early 1980s, my life took an unexpected turn when I accepted a position as a youth guide at a remote wilderness camp designed for teenagers aged 12 to 15. Set in a picturesque but isolated location, the camp's environment resembled those seen in a thriller movie. Young, inexperienced staff and minimal adult supervision. For privacy reason, I'll refrain from naming the camp, but it's worth noting that it's still operational and the bizarre incident I experienced has turned into an almost mythical tale, often recounted during late night gatherings. I initially viewed this role as an easy way to bolster my college application. It was a full time commitment throughout the summer where I was responsible for supervising outdoor activities for the campers. The camp was several towns away from my hometown, and I was unfamiliar with both the staff and the attendees. However, I've always had an easy time making friends and adapting to new environments. The era back then was much more relaxed with lenient rules for everyone at the camp. The staff arrived a week before the camper to prepare and bond with one another. The senior staff believed that this pre-camp bonding would foster a sense of camaraderie, essential for smooth operations with minimal supervision. There was an on-call adult in the main office cabin for emergencies, but largely the camp functioned with the staff and campers left to manage their own. The cabins for staff were nestled deep in the woods. Since I owned a Jeep suited for off-road, I had permission to park it nearby, which was practical for emergencies. The living arrangements were gender segregated, but everyone in the neighboring cabin was amiable and outgoing. Our first night was filled with stories and laughter around a campfire, some local staff shared tales of mysterious entities in the woods, stirring a mix of skepticism and mild anxiety among us. In the following days, we got acquainted with the camp layout, safety protocols, and first aid. The only certification required of us, the centerpiece of the camp was a beautiful man-made lake, which I was particularly eager to explore. We were advised to always have a companion and to never wander alone, echoing the same rules to the campers for their safety. Several days in, camp routine was running smoothly. I had bonded well with the other staff members and even had an eye on a potential summer fling. One morning, finding myself without companions for a swim, I decided to bend the rules and drove my Jeep down to the lake. En route, I ran into Cheryl, another instructor headed the same way, breaking yet another rule about unsupervised mixed gender pairings. We decided to go to the lake together. The day was perfect until an unsettling splash and a bizarre moaning noise echoed from across the lake, initially dismissing it as other staff enjoying the lake. A sense of unease soon crept over us. The serenity of the day was shattered when the noises repeated, louder and closer than before. To our disbelief, an enormous creature emerged from the lake heading straight toward us. Its size was staggering and it moved with an unsettling speed. Emitting ter terrifying noises in a state of panic, Cheryl and I made a split-second decision to swim back to the shore aiming for my jeep. Cheryl reached the shore ahead of me and scrambled toward the vehicle. I was close behind, but the creature's thunderous approach was unnerving. We barely managed to get into the jeep 
but in her frantic state, Cheryl crashed it into a tree. The creature, now on land, loomed over us, easily twelve feet tall. In a terrifying moment, it reached for Cheryl, trying to pull her out of the jeep. Driven by fear and adrenaline, I struggled to fend off the creature. After a tense standoff, it released Cheryl, locking eyes with me momentarily before retreating into the woods. We drove to the nurse's cabin, Cheryl in shock and injured. We concocted a story about a car accident to explain her injuries, but the nurse seemed to sense there was more to our tale. Soon after, Cheryl left the camp, deeply affected by the encounter. For the rest of the summer, I was extra cautious, especially around the lake. This incident has stayed with me over the years, heightening my awareness during outdoor activities. Reflecting on it, I believe we encountered a creature resembling Bigfoot, considering the camp's location in a region known for such sightings. This harrowing experience has made me acutely aware of the mysteries that may exist in the wilderness. It's a reminder of the unknowns that lurk in the shadows of nature. The incident at the lake has instilled in me a profound respect for the unexplained phenomena in our world, and I often ponder the fate of Cheryl and the true nature of the creature we encountered that fateful day. On to the next one. My encounter with evil in the woods didn't only involve me, but also had to do with my then four-year-old son. I will never forget it for as long as I live, but luckily he seemed to have forgotten all about it, but it took a long time. When he was little, his mother and I bought a bunch of land in the middle of nowhere off the highway near the small town in Nebraska where we both had grown up and where we had been living until that point. My wife was pregnant again, and we needed more room anyway. It was a dream for both of us, living in the middle of nowhere, and with no nosy neighbors to have to deal with, or people above and below us in a small apartment. We both grew up in the woods, camping, hiking, and fishing, and so far had raised our son out there, doing those same things too. Neither my wife, my son, nor myself ever had any sort of interest in the paranormal, and we didn't watch horror movies or anything like that. So it was strange to us when our son started being terrified to sleep in his own bed, in his own room, in the new house. I'll start at the beginning, though. When we first moved into the new cabin, everything was perfect, and we were absolutely thrilled with it. My son had plenty of room to run and play, not only in our very large backyard, but also in the woods beyond it. My wife was pregnant, as I said, but other than that, my son didn't have any siblings. There were other children he played with at his preschool, but we didn't live in a neighborhood, so to speak, once we moved, and so, really, all he had was himself and his own imagination. He was only four, so of course, we didn't allow him to just go and wander around in the woods wherever he wanted to go without one of us supervising him closely. One night, though, he had been playing in the backyard while my wife and I set up dinner on the table on the back deck that overlooked the yard itself. I was grilling and she was in and out of the house getting things to set the table. I turned around for no more than a minute to open the door and let my wife back out, and she looked at me and asked where her son had gone. My heart dropped immediately because I knew if she was asking me that, then he wasn't in the yard with inside of us. I turned and ran down the deck step and called out to him. My wife followed closely behind me, and within just a few seconds, we both heard him scream. I told my wife to go back onto the deck and I ran into the woods to try and find our son. It didn't take me long, but I found him, not because he was screaming anymore, but because I heard him talking in a hushed tone and whimpering. I walked up on him quietly, but there was no one there. 
I called out to him, and he turned and ran to me. I picked him up and carried him back to the house. When I asked him who he had been talking to in the woods, he said it was the little boy who looked like him. He said the boy invited him to come into the woods and play, and then turned into some sort of gigantic demon. My son was really scared, but my wife and I were thinking that maybe he had seen something on the television that we weren't aware of, and maybe he just wasn't telling us. We asked him, but he insisted that wasn't the case, and that he was telling the truth. My wife and I decided to drop the subject because it was obviously upsetting him even more. But from that night on, it was one long roller coaster of him calling us into his room in the middle of the night, saying the demon boy was back and that he came from the woods. He would also make me or my wife, whoever was tucking him in at night, investigate his closet and under his bed for the demon boy. We were concerned not because we believed there was some sort of evil spirit or demonic child harassing our son, but because we felt bad that he was so terrified and obviously suffering like he was. We would oblige him and check for the monsters and then try and get him to calm down enough to go to sleep. Sometimes I would sneak in and check on him while he slept, only to find him standing at his bedroom window and staring blankly with fear on his face out into the woods. He would always be looking in the direction where he had gone that one night and found the alleged demon boy. We were greatly concerned, but again, we figured he would just grow out of it, and it was more than likely a figment of his bored and overactive imagination. Turns out it wasn't, and I would learn that firsthand and for myself not too long after all this first started. It had been about six months since the initial encounter, and my son and I had gone and played in the woods more than a few times in that time. It never failed, though, that when it came for him to go to bed, he would make a check for the demon boy. One night after my wife had given him his bath and said good night to him, he asked if I would come in and read him a bedtime story. This wasn't a great deviation from our normal routine and not an out-of-the-ordinary request, and so, of course, I obliged him. When I went into his room, though, the only light on was the nightlight plugged into the wall furthest from the bed and the moonlight that was shining almost directly on the foot of his bed. I remember feeling so incredibly uncomfortable in his presence that night, but I couldn't put my finger on what was different. However, as time wore on and he and I read through the storybook, he had chosen several times, he was giggling, and for the first time in a long time, he seemed like he was okay with being in his own room to go to sleep. I kissed him goodnight and got up to leave the room for the night and let him get some sleep. As soon as I was about to walk out the door, he asked me if I was forgetting something, and I turned and pretended like I didn't know what he meant. My son giggled again and asked me to check the closet and under the bed for monsters, like I always did. I figured the fact that he was giggling was a good sign, and so I did what he asked. I searched the closet first and reassured him there was nothing there. Then I got down on my knees to look under the bed for him. He was lying on the bed at that point and watched me walk to the one side of the bed from the closet and get down low enough to look. I heard strange noises as I got closer to under the bed and I was really confused because it sounded like muffled crying. I looked at my son who suddenly looked very scarfed and very serious as he told me the demon boy was under his bed. I didn't believe in it, of course, but he seemed so certain and so serious that it did give me pause for a moment. I took a deep breath, moved the sheet that was hanging off the bed out of the way, and I looked under the bed. I screamed when I saw, there, under the bed, my son was lying on his stomach and facing me. Tears were streaming down his face, and his hands were over his mouth like they had been trying to muffle any noise he might make in his extreme terror. I couldn't speak, but I didn't have to. My son cried out, He's on top of the bed, Daddy. 
the demon boy. I was so confused, and I wasn't thinking, but I grabbed my son out from under the bed, and when we both looked, there was nothing and no one else in the room with us. I sat my son down and calmed him before asking him what was going on. He said the demon boy had run out of the closet and jumped on his bed when mommy went to go get me from the other room and that it told him he better not make any noise. He told me it wasn't really a boy. He said he didn't know what to do but stayed under the bed and hid as I snuggled and read a bedtime story to the demonic thing that had taken on his likeness so out. I couldn't put my finger on the differences. I had felt like something was off with my son that night, but I never even dreamed that's what it was. I let my son sleep in my room that night. I didn't tell my wife what had occurred and swore my son to secrecy as well. It took a long time, but eventually he just sort of forgot about it. I often see red eyes looking out at us from the trees when we are in the woods at night or staring into his bedroom window when I'm there saying goodnight to him. He doesn't have to ask me to check under the bed anymore. I do it automatically now. There was no way my wife and I could have afforded to move at that time, and we would have taken a huge loss on the house we had just built. There was no way I could tell her then, but I have told her since. Our youngest child is just about four years old, and lately she has been talking about a scary boy that visits her in her room at night and terrifies her. I am at a loss for what to do and figured maybe getting this out there would be helpful because maybe someone will have some answers for me. If nothing else, it helps to finally be able to talk about it since I've been keeping it a secret for the last four years or so. I am terrified and the demonic presence I feel sometimes, the terrible smells in the home that seem to have no explanation, and what my children have claimed to see is all becoming very overwhelming and extremely hard to ignore. I've been searching online, but aside from an actual exorcism, there isn't much advice out there for handling something like this. We still aren't in a position financially to sell the house, but I spend every night wondering if my kids and my wife are safe in our home. I mean, how could I defend them against something that I don't know what it is and can barely see myself? It still messes with my mind that I sat there for such a long time with an evil, demonic entity that was posing as my son and didn't know the difference at all. Luckily, my oldest grew out of it, but the fact that it still somewhat terrorizes me with the constant reminders of its presence is something I simply cannot wrap my mind around, and I have no idea what it wants, and therefore don't know how to get rid of it. That's really all there is to it. Thanks for letting me share this, and I hope, if nothing else, it helps someone out there in a similar situation in their home. Always listen to your children no matter how outlandish or far-fetched what they're saying to you is. On to the next one. I am very excited to announce that on this channel we are offering membership. Now, I never want my subscribers to feel like I am paywalling content, so new videos will remain 100% completely free. The membership is a way for those who feel like they want to support me to do so and help the channel grow monetarily. What your membership gives you access though to are subscriber badges, which evolve with how long you've been a member, and you can watch your badge grow from a baby Bigfoot all the way up to a sage Bigfoot. Also, as a member, you'll get access to member-only emojis, which are these beautiful Bigfoot emojis. Again, I never want to paywall any content on this channel. I always want the content to be free because I love this community and I want you to enjoy your time here. But if you do wish to support me making this content, this membership is a way for you to do that. Thanks for listening and on to the next one. 
my brother Mark and I were riding in the back of my dad's green Ford pickup in the early summer, just outside of Georgetown in White County in Arkansas. My dad was driving, my grandpa was in the passenger seat, and my brother Larry was sitting between them. Mark was nine and a half at the time, and I had just turned 11. As we made the right turn on the new highway from Georgetown to Drakeown, I saw something 30 to 40 yards up the hill from the road. At first, it was so tall that I thought it was the stump of a tree that had been struck by lightning. But as we passed it, accelerating up the hill, it began to move. In three steps, it was to the ditch at the side of the road, and then it took one long step across the ditch into the middle of the two-lane highway. It turned its whole body to look at us going up the hill. Mark remembers a grayish splotch of fur on the chest, but otherwise the fur was dark brown in color, longish but not dangling, and it had red eyes. We recently discussed this incident with my dad in Springdale, Arkansas, but he remembers Elmer Drake telling people around that area that he had seen what he thought was a gorilla that had escaped from a zoo or a circus. Well, all I can say is that it wasn't a gorilla. Till Count and his grandson Randy told us about seeing a creature of some sort later on after we got to know him better. On to the next one. At Jonesville, near Falk in Middler County in Arkansas, 16 miles southwest of Texarkana, Bobby Ford, 25, and his family moved into the old Crank Place in Jonesville. Mr. Ford's wife was lying on the couch after midnight when a great paw made a pass at her through the hole in the window screen. She screamed the house down, and Bobby and three other adults ran outside. Near a wood beside the house, Bobby saw what looked like a man, about six feet tall, covered with hair, and very massive. His brother Douglas fired a gun at it, and it lurched away. Bobby notified Constable Ernest Walraven, who searched the area. One hour later, the creature kicked in the back door of the house, but at a second gunshot, it vanished. Later, as Bobby walked around the house, the thing grabbed him from the darkness, pulling him to the ground. The next morning, sheriff's officers found several large footprints outside. Still in Jonesville, four days later, Bobby Ford, 25, who had recently moved into the old crank place, came face to face with a six-foot-tall hairy monster that frightened Bobby so bad that he had run through the front door without even opening it. After a few days, he said he would not stay another night. Bobby was treated for scratches and shock after being attacked by what he described as a large hairy creature. Mr. Ford had moved into the place in late April. On to the next one. Near Falk, in Miller County in Arkansas, a Bigfoot that was six to seven feet tall was reported running across the road in front of cars by Mr. and Mrs. D.C. Woods and Mr. and Mrs. R.H. Sedgris, as well as other drivers on Highway 71. On to the next one. In Washington County, in Arkansas, in January, on two occasions, Miss G.W. Humphrey, her dogs barking loudly, looked out of her trailer home door and saw a strange humanoid creature walking past. On to the next one. In Springdale, at 10.15 p.m., Miss Humphrey, her three sons, and daughter-in-law were awakened by a pounding on her trailer. Miss Humphrey quieted down one of the children and went outside to find the cause. Outside was the biggest looking thing she had ever seen that alternated between walking on all fours and walking upright. Miss Humphrey had twice seen the same thing in January that same year. Still in Springdale, shortly after rapping on Miss Humphrey's trailer, Bill Hurt, who lived just south of her, saw the creature in his garden. The creature was staring at him with two great big eyes 
that he thought that it was some sort of animal, and when he yelled at the creature, it took off running. Other witnesses said that it resembled a huge hairy man. Our final sighting in Springdale was five miles north of Fayetteville. Barbara Robinson called police to report that a prowler had peered through her bedroom window at 612 West Allen Avenue. Police who investigated remarked that the prowler had to be at least seven feet tall since the window was that high and there was nothing there on which he could have stood on due to the structure of the house. On to the next one. Bigfoot witness Josh Morris received an interesting Bigfoot account from his wife's uncle, who claimed to have come face to face with Bigfoot inside his home in Spencer County, Kentucky. Such sightings of indoor humanoids are extremely rare, but as we have already seen, not entirely unheard of. They are extremely telling as to the true nature of these creatures claimed by so many experts to be altogether elusive, shy, and retiring, avoiding contact with humans at all costs. I had an interesting story told to me by my future brother-in-law's uncle the other night, Josh said. He was a kid back in the early 50s, heard a noise in the next room of his house, went to check it out, and came face to face with a large hairy creature. He said it was around seven to eight feet tall, covered in white hair, even over the nose, which he described as Caucasian looking, with big red eyes spread far apart, almost to the sides of the head. Its chest was rounded, like when a dog sits up on its hind legs, and there was a lot of hair on the feet, five fingers and five toes, with dark red nails. He said he stared at it right in the eyes for several minutes. Then something about its eyes changed and its blood ran cold, and he ran away to his mother in the other side of the house. When they got back, it was gone, and the doors were locked from the inside. Then his brother told of being in school, having to do a report on something weird that happened to them, and a girl in the class wrote about seeing the same creature and seeing it walk through the upstair wall of her house. One Spencer County resident claims that he has had repeated sightings of a Bigfoot-type creature over the last several years, beginning in 2002. The first time I saw it was in the year 2002. It was squatted down in a tree when I got home at around 10 p.m. At first, I thought it was a human. I yelled at it, what are you doing? And it jumped out of the tree. It was at least 15 feet up in the tree, yet it jumped out of it and landed with what seemed to be no injury. When it landed, it stood up on two legs and took off through the wood. I knew then it wasn't a human because it was too tall. It seemed to have a rather stocky upper body, but a skinnier lower body. The second time I saw it was a few days later. I got home at around 1 a.m. or so, and went and got out of my car, I saw a bipedal animal standing to the left of me, watching me. It was only about 15 feet from me, standing right next to my mom's truck. Using the truck as a reference, the witness stated that the creature was at least 8 feet tall. He was reluctant to tell of his sightings until his mother told of seeing a very tall humanoid when she parked the truck earlier. His third sighting took place in the same general area. It was right next to our house, walking towards me when I pulled up, he said. Again, it was around 1 a.m. He got out of his vehicle and yelled, I see you, and the creature stopped in its tracks and stood, unmoving, as the witness hastily entered the house. The fourth time was the most dramatic and the clearest observation I had to date, he said. My Australian shepherd was barking crazily at the back door, so I walked outside with him. He took a left off the porch and headed to the tree line along our side yard. Barking, the dog stepped a few feet into the woods where he was no longer in view. Then the barking stopped and the dog backed out of the woods, wagging his tail and looking up. 
the brush began to move, and out came a really long, slender, muscular left leg. The floodlights were on, so I got a really good look at it. It was hairless and seemed to be a light beige color with a slightly gray hue to it. The most abnormal thing about it, in regards to human terms, was that it had a groin at about the heft of my chest or higher. It made me immediately think of the image that most people describe aliens as looking like. My dog looked at me and the creature stopped moving. It slowly moved its left leg up and moved it back toward its body and then took off through the wood. The fifth sighting, which happened in 2005, occurred in broad daylight as the thing was running swiftly down the hill. It looked like the upper body was hair covered and the legs were not, he said. It was at least eight feet tall. The dogs, usually fearless, did not give chase. The witness admitted it was possible that the thing's legs could have been covered with hairs as well, just of a much lighter color than the brown colored stocky upper portion of its body. Strange noises, which sounded like a child's howling, have been heard in the area as well. On to the next one. Does Bigfoot walk abroad in Taylor County, Kentucky as well? My guess would be a resounding yes. A creature or monster has been known to haunt the woods near Campbellsville for at least the last 100 years. Around 1895, there used to be a lot of talk about a creature coming out of the woods in South Campbellsville. Many people swore they had seen it. My dad used to go to school at Smith Ridge, called Carthage, as a boy. Him and some buddies came riding by this area one evening, coming home from school. Every horse just stopped with no command. They couldn't get the horses to move forward for half an hour. They couldn't explain it. A couple of them said they had seen the monster. I think it's safe here to assume that the creature that came out of the woods was likely a Bigfoot. More recently, further alleged Sasquatch activity, this time in the form of blood-curdling vocalizations, has taken place in Taylor County, as this next testimony. The following account of a nighttime yowler comes from Campbellsville, Kentucky, just off Burlington Road near the Pittman Valley area. In 1977, my husband and I bought a small hobby farm in Taylor County, Kentucky, just outside the town of Campbellville. Our farm was surrounded by neighboring farms, but no one lived on the land bordering ours. The owners all lived in town. So, our little farm was fairly isolated, and I liked it that way. In the summer of 1978, I believe the month was July, my husband, while alone at home, heard a sound one evening that frightened the daylight out of him. And he doesn't frighten easily. He called me at a friend's place, screaming at me, where are the shotgun shells? His nervousness scared me. I didn't know what was going on, and he wouldn't tell me. He just kept screaming, where are the shotgun shells? I finally told him, and he slammed the phone down. It wasn't until later that my husband related the story of what he had heard. He never did see anything, and the years went by with no answers to that cry he had heard that evening. Although, for the first several years, as we watched nature films, which had various wildlife cries, I kept asking him, did it sound like that? To which he always replied, no, it was nothing like I'd ever heard before. In 1988, again, in the summer, and the month was August, it had just started to turn dark in the evenings when my husband came home from outside, and all he said was, do you want to hear the sound? He didn't have to say any more. I knew right away what he was referring to, so we both went right outside and stood outside our kitchen window. I was standing there listening when I told him, I don't hear anything. He quickly replied, shh, just wait. So I continued to listen. All of a sudden, this horrible cry came up from our wood where our two creeks merged. It caused chills to run up and down my spine. My first reaction was shock. Then another cry was heard. This time, I felt myself 
slowly edging backward toward the house. Whatever this thing was, the cry was like nothing I'd ever heard from any wild animal before, and I remember starting to shake with fear. Then another cry was heard. This time, it came from across the road in the woods, where the creek continued to flow. This cry hadn't even crescendoed when there was another cry heard from our side of the woods again. Oh my God, there were two of them, I thought. That was it for me. I turned and ran into the house. My husband came in with me, but he grabbed the shotgun and went back outside. He wanted me to hold the light for him as he investigated the woods, and I stated, you're out of your mind. I'm not going back out there. That basically was all that happened that night. My husband never saw anything, nor did I, but I did smell something. It was a very strong, musty odor that wasn't pleasant. Actually, the odor was like wafting across with a gentle breeze. So sometimes it was very light and sometimes much stronger. I remember wrinkling up my nose when it was strong and thinking, what on earth is that smell? So now, after 10 years, I'd heard the same sound that my husband had heard alone back in 1978. The next day, I did go down to where the two creeks meet and walk along the banks looking for strange prints, but didn't see any. Even though it was broad daylight and a gorgeous sunny day, just being down there gave me the creep. What had happened the night before had really shook me up, and never again did I enjoy being down there anymore. Just the replay in my mind of those cries was enough to make me jumpy whenever I was close to the woods or the creek area again. The sound of those cries stuck in my mind, and I had a gnawing feeling that I had heard that sound before, but where? I was a video collector back then, and quickly went through all of my video collection to see if anything would jog my memory. I have many natural wildlife tapes, so I thought maybe that is where I had heard it. But when I came across a movie entitled Sasquatch, a feeling inside of me told me to watch this tape. So I did. I sat in my living room and watched all the way through that movie until close to the end. They had the sound the very same sound that my husband and I had just heard a few nights ago. As soon as I heard it, chills ran up and down my spine. I quickly rewound the tape to the beginning of where that sound was and left it there until my husband came home from work that evening. As soon as he came home, I told him I had something I wanted him to watch. So, within a few minutes, he was seated in the living room and I played the tape. As soon as that cry was heard on the tape, he jumped up yelling, that's it, that's the sound. We replayed that part of the tape over and over again, trying to allow all this information to sink in. We now felt we knew what we had heard. It was a Sasquatch, or actually two of them in the middle of Kentucky. An experience like this, you don't ever forget. You can't. It'll stay with us for the rest of our lives. There were several other odd details that she later recalled thinking about the event. The first was that while I was listening for the strange sound, I later realized that none of the normal summer sounds were heard. No cricket, no caddy did, no bullfrog. None of the sounds that we always heard on a summer evening were around. It was dead silent until this thing let loose with its god-awful cry. Another was this odor that kept drifting up. It was really offensive. It's hard to describe, but it was like a musty smell that also smelled like death too. Anyone who has lived in the country and has had a rat die within the walls or floors knows what I mean. Add a strong musty odor to this and it's close to what I smelled that night. The third thing that I noticed, and maybe this is the oddest of them all, is that my horse was standing near the barn when all of this happened, and he acted like nothing was wrong. Even when these things were howling, or whatever you want to call that sound, my horse just acted like he heard nothing. He continued to munch on grass as if he neither heard nor sensed anything was wrong. This has always baffled me. 
Could it be that the horse could not hear the same sound as the witness and were therefore unaffected by them? The witness also noted that there have been many Black Panther sightings in this area, but feels sure what she and her husband heard that night was definitely not a cat. I hope you enjoyed those encounters, and if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!